I'm Father Mitch Pacwa, and welcome to EWTN Live, where we bring you guests from around the world, and we are really doing that today. Tonight, we will talk with a Cistercian monk who is also a bishop, and we'll speak to him about the ways he shepherds his flock to keep them close to the Good Shepherd, Jesus Christ. Before we do that, we want to speak briefly with EWTN's Peter Gagnon about new programs that are coming your way. Peter, what have you got for us this time? Well, in September, we're going to debut a, a new grid. Um, we're going to expand some of our programming, bring back some older programming that maybe some of our viewers haven't seen in the past. But um, there's three particular programs I'd like to highlight that we aired as mini-series, but now we've added new episodes. There have been new episodes produced, so we're going to expanding that to be actual weekly series. Oh. Um, the first one, a very powerful one, is I Forgive with Immaculate Libagiza. Um, extremely powerful program about forgiveness. Um, obviously, she had a very powerful experience in Rwanda and discusses that, but also other people who have gone through various traumatic experiences in life, but um, instead of being bitter and angry, they actually um, turn to forgiveness and how that truly changed their lives. So very powerful series that people really want to tune into. So um, I forgive. Um, the next one is um, My Lord's Faith Journey. And so it's uh, Marlene Watkins and the North American uh, volunteers, uh, Lords volunteers. They share stories of how Lords, um, people visiting Lords, uh, has impacted them. Mm -hmm. Healing that takes place spiritually, physically, and um, it, it's a, a wonderful series as well. And it kind of brings you to Lords and brings our viewers there and, and the connection to Our Lady. And um, that's, that's a very well done program. And then thirdly is The Quest, um, a program done by the University of Dallas. And uh, it's just people seeking God and, and the quest for God and how when you truly seek Him and, and follow His will, how it impacts your life. So people of all ages, of all walks of life. So uh, it's a great series as well. The other thing I'd like for people to look at is we're bringing back, um, we have all new episodes. So Living Right with Dr. Ray. Dr. Ray went on location, taped new episodes. So look for that as well. And um, we also have new episodes of Icons with the, the CFR Friars, um, which, is, which is a great program taped in New York. So we'll have new episodes of that along with Living Right with Dr. Ray. And then Chesterton Station. So um, it's a really fun program that we do with um, an actor portraying uh, G.K. Chesterton. And he's, he's going to bring on some different guests this year. So you'll have to see who those guests are. So um, it's really a fun program. And then finally, uh, this past weekend, we had our EWTN family celebration here in, in Birmingham. And uh, you participated in right. it. You were there. And uh, so we're going to air the talks, not this coming weekend, but following weekend, um, the 9th and 10th of September. And you'll see the talks in uh, the various, Father Wade was there, Deacon Harold Burke Servers, uh, Jim and Joy Pinto. We had a special live show that you participated in, hosted by Jeanette. And uh, it was just a, and then a family talk with Mike Warsaw and Doug Keck. And uh, it was really a great event, great weekend. And uh, people can tune in and to see all those talks. So everyone, all of you should go to EWTN.com. And uh, on our website, you can click on TV. And there will be information about all these new programs and, uh, and when they can see the family celebration in their area. And if they want, they can also get the EWTN app for free and watch it there? They should get it there. And in our on-demand page, uh, a lot of these series, I Forgive, The Quest, et cetera, My Lord's Faith and Journey, they can also access them via on-demand. So EWTN.com forward slash on-demand. Um, you have it at your fingertips. Yep. Uh, no, it's re it really is a good thing mm -hmm. to have. Thank you, Peter. All right. Thank you, Appreciate Father. it very much. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes with tonight's guest, so please stay with us. Welcome back. We have a guest tonight, very interesting guest. He was born Lutheran 
and converted to Catholicism at the age of 19. He joined the Cistercian Order of Strict Observance as a monk in 2002 and served as the abbot of the Mount St. Bernard Abbey in Leicestershire, England. And that was from 2015 to 2019. But that was interrupted when he was appointed the Bishop of the Diocese of Trondheim in Norway in 2019. He is with us tonight to talk about how he tries to shepherd his flock in a number of different ways to keep them close to Jesus Christ, our good shepherd. So please welcome Bishop Eric Varden. Bishop Varden, welcome. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be with you. It's good to have you with us. Um, this is uh, something that we're not quite so accustomed to. There, there is a fairly s small group of men in the world who are bishops, but an even smaller subset of bishops who are converts. Wouldn't that be about true? I would suspect that it's a growing proportion, but that's ah. a purely subjective uh, estimate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I'm sure, I hope that uh, you all get together and share notes. <laughs> <laughs> but first of all, if you would tell us, uh, you're from Norway, and Lutheranism is the religion of your country. Is that not true? That is true. Mm -hmm. In, At least uh, it, it has traditionally been the denomination of this country, but it, it's mm -hmm. a situation in rapid change. And for a number of centuries, it was uh, actually the official religion of Norway. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With a lot of support from the, the former kings and queens. Um, what was it about... Catholicism that attracted you away from Lutheranism? What was the state of Lutheranism in your experience? And what was attractive about Catholicism? Well, if, if I may qualify your question, I, sure. I'm not sure it would be true to say in my, in my case that I was attracted away from Lutheranism because I hadn't really ever been particularly rooted in it. I was baptized in the Lutheran Church when I was born, um, but I grew up in a family that wasn't particularly explicit in its practice. It was mm -hmm. uh, certainly very respectful of religion, <clears throat> and uh, th th there was a, a minimum of, of, of prayer in our lives. I mean, we, 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 we always prayed before going to bed and went to church at Christmas, but that was about it. So mm -hmm. I wasn't, uh, I, I never had a very strong rootedness in the Lutheran church. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Is that normal in Norway or was that something that was an aberration? Well, I think my experience was pretty typical of the sort of people I grew up with in my school and in my class anyway. So in, in, in the area I come from, the, the southeast of the country, I, I think that was roughly typical. Mm -hmm. Well then, what was it that attracted you to Catholicism? Well, it was really a kind of an awakening within, which um, still after all these years is mysterious and wonderful to me. Um, music has always been an important language and an important medium to me. Um, mm -hmm. I listened to music. I was very sensitive to music when I was a child. And when I was about 15, I discovered the music of Gustav Mahler. Mm -hmm. And um, one day I'd gone into Oslo, the capital, and I'd gone to a CD shop and I'd splashed out from my savings on a recording of Mahler's Second Symphony, the Resurrection Symphony, mm -hmm. which I went home and listened to. I was on my own in the house, I remember. And there was something that happened 
during that experience of listening to the music um, in, in, in the final, the fifth movement, which is a choral movement, with a marvelous text of a seeking soul encountering an angel that assures the soul you were not born in vain, you have not lived and you have not suffered in vain. And it pierced me. Uh, I mean, I, I was 15, it wasn't as if I'd lived and suffered all that much. Um, but there was something about uh, what was transmitted to me through that experience that was just compelling in its obvious truth. And mm -hmm. I felt something burst within me uh, during the course of that music, so that when the music finished, I was stunned. And I thought to myself, I remember thinking to myself, it'll be very interesting to think about this tomorrow morning when the experience would have passed, but then it didn't pass. I, I, I lived from then on with that sort of wound within, if you like, and then I had to start looking for a reality that corresponded to it. Mm -hmm. this, th this is something that um, I, I, it reminds me of the passage in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3, where after talking about the time for various parts of life, for peace, for war, for sowing, for rending, and so on, it ends how God placed eternity within our hearts. Mm -hmm. And it's as if we then have to look for that which can satisfy that implanted desire for eternity. And that sounds similar to your experience there. It's very much so. And I think, I mean, it, 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 it's a paradigm we find in, in Scripture, as you say, and in the lives of the saints. Uh, we've just celebrated again the Feast of St. Augustine, who is another yes. prime example of that sort of awakening. Mm -hmm. And I expect that that sort of experience is not all that uncommon. I mean, after all, if we take it seriously, which I think we must, that the human being is created in the image of God and carries in its deepest being a trace of that divine imprint. Obviously, th there is constitutionally something within us that longs for that reality that corresponds to its, its desire. And I think uh, many people are sensitive to that sort of experience. The trouble is we have culturally now rather lost the coordinates by which to make sense of that kind of experience. That's certainly a, an impact of the secular society. And I, I remember during the COVID pandemic, a number of our states ordered the closing of churches. They didn't want COVID transmitted during church services. But they left open liquor stores and stores, stores that uh, sold marijuana. And it was as if to say, you can stifle that feeling with drugs or alcohol, but you know we're afraid of you discovering the real satisfaction, the satisfaction that will give you life rather than death, by going to meeting Christ in church. I think there's something to that, but I, mean, I think I'd perhaps be imply, inclined to be a bit more pragmatic because it's been in, in the Norwegian and I think the European um, legislation of that extraordinary time, the, the terminology was what constituted um, essential encounters and essential merchandise. Mm -hmm. And it was very striking that, um, you know, going to church, going to mass, uh, wasn't obviously present to our government and to our society as an essential encounter. Yep. Um, but to my mind, that, that also calls for self-examination for us as Christians. Um, uh, and prompts us to ask ourselves, well, what, what is it about my life that testifies to this as an essential encounter? And, and do I cultivate this, cult cultivate mm -hmm. this encounter mm -hmm. as something essential? And I think in that respect, it was quite a, 
it was quite a useful wake-up call. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, this is something that uh, was a, that the wake-up call that Gustav Mahler's Second Symphony offered you was uh, something that you continued to follow through uh, into the, the, the church, it seems. It was very much so. So that, that, um, that experience, as I said, occurred when I was 15, and in the spring, I think, and in that, that autumn, I left Norway to go to an international sixth form school in Wales, in the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was when my exile began. Um, and that was for me a time of, of seeking. I started reading the scriptures, I started reading church history, I talked to friends who were believers and took their faith seriously. And um, I, I, I had some very significant encounters during, during those years, those are very significant years between 16 and 18. And so I began uh, a course of formal instruction in my first year as an undergraduate at university when I was 18. And as you said, initially, I was received into the church when I was 19. What then led you to the Cistercian Monastery? Well, that's another long story that I shan't bore you with in all its details. But I, um, it, was during, it was during my those adolescent years at the school in Wales that I visited a monastery for the first time, more or less by mistake, actually, by chance, but really by mistake. Um, it was a monastery on an island of Tenby in Wales, and it turned out to be a monastery of the Cistercians of the Strict Observance, although that was a term that made no sense to me at the time. <laughs> so I was 17 when I went there, and I was overwhelmed by it. I was slightly frightened by it, by the radicality, by the detachment, but particularly the, the fact that this monastery was on an island, and when I heard that there were monks there who'd been there for 50 years and who'd only really left the island to go to the dentist, I thought, well, how, how can one live that way? Um, so there was something that I found quite frightening and even repellent, and that there were other things that I found profoundly attractive. It attracted me, I mean, I, there was a moral attraction in the fact that here were people who'd recognized something as true and then had really risked and invested everything in order to explore that truth in its fullness. And then I could see a community that was balanced and where people seemed happy. And I had, I had one significant encounter with a monk one afternoon. I'd been out for a walk. He's gone to God now. Uh, he was quite an elderly man then, and we stopped and talked for about two minutes about nothing, about, about the weather. It was an entirely uh, banal conversation in a way, but there was such kindness and such benevolence in that man, and there was something about him that was just luminous, that I was gobsmacked by it. And I remember going up to my room in the guest house and sitting down on my bed and thinking, Whatever it is that man has got, that's what I long for. Mm -hmm. And so the search for that began. But it took a long time, and it was only 10 years later that I joined the monastery where I um, then settled and remained after 10 years at university. It, but it was not the monastery on the island, correct? No, no so a, a monastery of the same order, but in, um, in England, in the in the British Midlands. Mm -hmm. And you, did they, did that monastery have uh, another apostolate? Like some monasteries will have schools and such. Uh, did, was there a particular apostolate or work of that community that they, they did? No, it's a, it, it's a hallmark of our order, really, the, 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 the Cistercians of the Strict Observance, or the Trappist Order, which it's often called, mm -hmm. that um, our apostolate is prayer. Um, hospitality, obviously, as St. As Benedict lays down in the rule. I mean, mm -hmm. he simply states, as a matter of fact, that 
a monastery is never without guests. Mm -hmm. And he says each guest that comes should be received as if he were Christ himself. That's his principle mm -hmm. of hospitality. Um, but apart from that, um, no, the apostolate is uh, a, a life of prayer and sacrifice. And obviously one of, um, one of, one of praise and worship on, mm -hmm. on our own behalf and on behalf of the world. My father was uh, objected very strongly to my vocation to the priesthood, but he was absolutely dumbfounded by the idea of prayer and fasting and not doing something. You know, how mm. can they just pray all day? And I remember I was, I don't know, maybe in high school, uh, and I, I said to him, no, I was in college. That's right, I was in college already. And I said to him, Dad, you know, he, he was a mechanic and a, a truck and cab driver, so he knew cars really, really well. And I said, Dad, the battery in your cab, you know, doesn't do anything, but it gives energy to get everything else started. Why don't you think of the monks as doing that? <laughs> and it was a, an image that he could understand, but it, it's something that the communities that spend their time in prayer and fasting and detachment are like the battery of the church. And that's how I've often thought of them. They give an energy that may not be so visible, there's no moving parts, but it's very essential. And I mean, I, I, I agree, and I think that would correspond to monastic self-understanding and certainly to a theological understanding of monasticism. Mm -hmm. That will often entail, obviously, um, living through times of a certain darkness because one doesn't see the fruitfulness of what one does. The, the constitutions of our order speak of a hidden apostolic fruitfulness, and mm -hmm. the mystery of that hiddenness can sometimes be a cause of, of, uh, of, of suffering and perplexity in the life of a monk. But it's one that um, invites us and even forces us to go deep and there to encounter that profound and sacramental solidarity uh, with the, the entire church. Yes. And as a matter of fact, that even adds to my imagery uh, because the battery is usually in the dark underneath the hood, or as they'd say in England, the bonnet of the car. That you're sort of it's just hidden in the dark, just being there. And uh, that's often monastic life as well. Absolutely. And obviously, the battery depends for its usefulness on being recharged. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Now, this life in the monastery was interrupted by the call for you to become the Bishop of Trondheim. Yes, that is true. And uh, how was that transition for you? To be honest, initially it was very painful because yeah. um, I, I, I loved the monastic life and I still love the monastic life. It's a wonderful life. Um, uh, not easy, but uh, uh, no life is easy. That is my, uh, the, that is my accumulating, uh, steadily accumulating conviction. But it's a life of, um, that, that makes a lot of sense and that is, uh, that, 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 that is beautiful on many levels. And obviously I, I, I was attached to my community, to my brethren, mm -hmm. so being uprooted from that was for me initially quite a trauma. Um, but obviously, you know, one, one joins a monastery in order to try to learn to be obedient. And, you know, when, when we speak about obedience, it's not a matter of, of blind obedience, of, of, of being a machine or an automaton that just uh, uh, responds to, to impulses, but a Christian obedience is always a seeing obedience and a conscious obedience uh, mm -hmm. concerned with trying to hear and discern the will of God in our lives and then following that will of God. And 
I've often reflected on this. You know, people one meets in the monastery or in pastoral conversations often complain of the opaqueness of the will of God in their lives and wish for it to be clearer. But from my own experience, I can say that it doesn't necessarily make it easier when the will of God is so clear that it reaches you in, form of a, in the form of a signed document, uh, <laughs> you know, telling you to up sticks and to go somewhere else and to start really a new existence in a way. Although, I mean, as, as time passes, I'm more and more conscious of all the fundamental continuities. And now, you know, I, I, I found great happiness also in this, in this new state and this new ministry. You are not the first monk to be called to be a bishop who had great reluctance. I, we, we can read the stories of many, uh, some of the fathers of the church and all through history that some tried to run away from the call to the episcopacy, but that's not obedience. You know, and it, it just reminds me of how our Lord left the absolutely wonderful hidden life with the holiest human being created, his mother, and then had to go out to the public ministry. Uh, and this was, uh, I'm sure, a, a similar experience of going from the obscurity, but, you know, the, the wonderful experience of being with his blessed mother for 30 years and then going off to deal with the sinners. Uh, but it was a necessary thing, and it sounds uh, somewhat parallel to your own experience. And, also, and, and the thing is, we, we, we can never see ourselves in perspective, and we never know ourselves where we fit best, where we're intended to be useful. And so I think we, we must cultivate that, um, that, that, that lightness of touch and of, and of movement, uh, enabling us to, um, yes, to respond to the call. It always impresses me in the story of Abraham, um, whom we follow over many years, that uh, when we reach that climactic encounter with, with the three messengers who come and proclaim that his son will be born, uh, the scripture uh, presents Abraham as moving with tremendous lightness and tremendous speed. He rushes and runs and he's, he's completely responsive. And that obviously is the, it's the point of obedience in order to, to, to make us useful, profitable servants. In as, as, as far as grace permits. And I, I think to help folks too, it's worth pointing out his initial call from God didn't come till he was 75 years old. No, it's important to remember that. And then he had to wait another 24 years before the angels appeared to him, the messengers from heaven, to say that he's going to be a father. I mean, this was a long novitiate. Absolutely. And, and, and uh, it, it is wonderfully and, and in some ways very comfortingly uh, paradigmatic for all of us. Exactly. Exactly. I think to see ourselves in his story is not a bad thing. Now, how large a city is Trondheim and how large is your diocese? Now, in territorial terms, the diocese, which is strictly speaking a, 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 an apostolic prelature, measures 55,000 square kilometers. And Trondheim is a city of about 200,000 inhabitants with, in addition, a university of about 40,000 students. Mm -hmm. Are there any other dioceses in Norway? Catholic diocese? There are three. So, so three. The, 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 the country has been sliced lengthwise. So there's the Diocese of Oslo in the south, and then there is the Prelature of Trondheim, and north of us, the Prelature of Tromsø. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and how many uh, 
people in your diocese are Catholic? It's a rather small population. There are about, on the books, we have about 18,000 Catholics here in the prelature of Trondheim. Mm -hmm. um, 18,000 Catholics coming from about 120 nations. So it's an extraordinarily cosmopolitan, multi-ethnic and multilingual community. I can imagine. Uh, Bishop Varden, we need to take a short break. I want to begin with this point. Now, uh, you know, start to talk about your mission today in the Diocese of Trondheim and, I, uh, and talk in particular about your uh, work on the internet. Uh, I'll let people know right now that your website is called coramfratribus.com. We'll put that up on the screen for people to see. But we'll talk about that and some of your other work in your diocese when we come back, if that's all right. Excellent. Good. Welcome back. We are speaking with Bishop Eric Varden of the Preliature of Trondheim in Norway. And we were just discussing a little bit about the tremendous diversity of his relatively small flock. Uh, tell us a bit about that. You said there are about 18,000 Catholics in your preliature? That's right. And from how many countries? About 120. That's, you know, so it's a lot of small ethnic groups, probably a number of, uh, of people are just one or two from certain countries. Yes. Yeah. And it is, I know, it, 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 sociologically speaking, it's a, it's a most interesting phenomenon. And um, obviously, and ecclesiastically, it's interesting, challenging, but also, also very graced. And something that I keep, <laughs> I keep finding quite astonishing is that, is that it works. <laughs> um, and that, uh, obviously, we, we've got to keep laboring to create and maintain unity, but I find... Uh, <laughs> Just the sheer extent of, of goodwill and the desire to build up something fruitful and beautiful and life-giving together, um, that goodwill is tremendous and almost universal. What would be the largest communities? Now, that uh, without, um, w without any competition, the largest community is the Polish community. Mm -hmm. And then we have quite a large Filipino presence, mm -hmm. quite a large Vietnamese presence that goes back two or even three generations now. Oh, and sure. And that's been a great enrichment to the church in Norway. There's quite a large Eritrean community. Mm -hmm. um, and then we start encountering the, 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 the smaller groups, both from, from South America, uh, from Africa, from, um, from East Asia, from the Middle East to some extent, and, um, and also obviously some North Americans and mm -hmm. um, some from uh, Australia or Oceania. Yeah, so it really is from all over. And this, this is something of the, the uh, Catholic aspect of your community that in that Greek sense, of it being this universal community that you have folks from everybody and this uh, variety is very, very important. And it, and it's, it strikes me as a, as a marvelous paradox. We were talking about um, my monastic roots earlier on and when my order, the Cistercian order made its first 
foundation in Scandinavia in the 11... 40s, no, hang on, the 1130s. Mm -hmm. um, it was a foundation made by St. Bernard himself from Clairvaux. Um, the annals of our order speaks of this foundation in extremis finibus mundi, at the Ends ultimate of the end earth. of the earth. <laughs> and I do think it's extraordinary that here in the furthest diaspora uh, and towards the end of the earth, we find the Catholicity of the Church present in such an embodied way. I, I just wonder, especially about the Eritreans, Filipinos, and Vietnamese who come from such hot cult, uh, uh, environments, uh, to be in one that uh, can be fairly chilly in the winter. <laughs> Yes, and, but they, they, they've really taken to that with, with a great deal of heroism. I, 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 I was just, I was privileged to have supper with um, one of our elderly Vietnamese ladies just a couple of days ago. Um, and she, she has a good um, way to walk to church, but she's, she's never failing. She's always there in all weathers. Uh, crampons on her shoes and uh, we find a lot of that sort of fortitude because obviously a lot of the Catholics who come here come from areas in which the church is persecuted where they've had to yes. to really fight in order to remain faithful and when they come here they're, they're, they're determined not to give that up cheaply and they're, they're great examples. Yeah, I, I would suspect that especially from those uh, well from Eritrea and Vietnam, where persecution of the church has uh, been a problem, uh, and but other places as well. And you know, this is uh, a, a great witness that their freedom of religion doesn't make them lax, but rather having the freedom of religion, uh, uh, you know, encourages them to take advantage of the freedom for a positive good. Absolutely. Yeah. And this, so maintaining this balance, and you know, I, I know here in the United States where we also have a very diverse population uh, in, in general, but also uh, within our Catholic communities, uh, we, we have great diversity. We oftentimes build up unity by having each ethnic community share some of their food with everybody else. Does that kind of fellowship also go on? <laughs> yes, that's a, that's a universal remedy, I think. It yes, always it is. Works. <laughs> yes, it is. Because those are countries that, that I, I, I love Eritrea and Ethiopian cuisine, as well as Vietnamese and and all these other communities, I mean, the Filipinos are just wonderful cooks, uh, and these other communities, uh, that's always a, a nice help to, to build up uh, bonds of friendship with each other. It is, and obviously, and, and, and there is something in that experience of cooking and eating together, which is just a, 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 a parable of what we're about fundamentally and essentially. Yep. Uh, St. Paul's description of how to behave during the agape meals is a very important lesson for us to continue uh, to let the diversity be complementary rather than something fractious. Absolutely. This and, 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 for, 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 and, and for everything to serve the cause of, um, of, of unity, to, 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 really, I mean, to be in the most basic sense of that word edifying, of, of, of building up rather than yes. putting down. Exactly, exactly. This is, uh, I, I find uh, that some of the anti-church and anti-religious forces within the United States keep emphasizing the difference in order to help create more friction, whereas our role as a church is to find that Christ unites us and the diversity that we experience is something we can share and bless each other with. Absolutely, and, and I think the church there presents 
quite an interesting microcosm that really should interest contemporary culture also in its secular expression because it shows that it is possible to build a unity which is real and respectful of, of diversity, but that has a cohesion that comes from a sense of having a shared goal which goes beyond self-interest. Yes, exactly. And, uh, and I think, too, the, the focus on the person of Jesus Christ, the focus on the life of the Blessed Trinity, it, it is something that is a, uh, the source of energy to unite that diversity among us. We need to keep Absolutely. centered on Christ. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and uh, appropriating and, and living that reality of being members of the mystical body as something, as, as something personal and real, a source of blessing, but also a source of responsibility. Yep. A second element, though, of your mission, you, you mentioned that you grew up at a time when Lutheranism was something that was in the background and the Christian origin of much of Norwegian culture was taken for granted, but it wasn't something that was so lively in people's lives. And many folks, uh, I, I think, have become fairly secular. How do you address that situation within your diocese? Well, obviously, arriving here, I've first of all had to try and get a handle on it because I, um, you know, I, I came back to Norway to take up this position and to start working in this ministry after having lived abroad for 30 years. So I'd only really lived in Norway as a child. So I mm -hmm. needed to get to know the country afresh. And one thing that struck me was precisely how much more marginal religion had become during the course of that generation. Mm -hmm. And it does make you think to realize just how quickly a cultural memory and a religious memory is lost. I mean, obviously now we see it serially, even in staunchly, traditionally staunchly Catholic nations like Poland or Ireland. Um, but I've been able to verify it here. And whereas when I grew up, um, the church in a, in, in, in a popular sense, without a very clear sense of definition, that was mostly associated with the Lutheran establishment, still mm -hmm. represented a force, uh, a kind of an authority against which many felt a call to, uh, to express opposition or against which they rebelled. Whereas now, the practice of faith has retired so far to the margins that it's become almost invisible and can seem an irrelevance. And that, at one level, is a failure and a source of sadness. Mm -hmm. At another level, I'm discovering this more and more, it opens new possibilities. Because whereas 25, 30 years ago, most people, well, let's, say, let's talk about young people, most people between 20 and 30, would assume that they knew what the gospel was, who Jesus Christ was, what Christianity stood for. Whereas now, many people in that age group uh, freely confess total ignorance. Mm -hmm. And that is also an opportunity because it gives you the opportunity to, you know, to tell the story of the prodigal son to someone who will hear it for the first time and to expand the crucial Christian terms of forgiveness, the reconciliation, uh, integrity, uh, unity, in a way which is fresh and can seem almost revolutionary. So I think there is potentially also an aspect of grace in this strange cultural climate which is ours. There's certainly a great task to live up to. I oftentimes in sermons have compared uh, lifelong Catholics and lifelong Christians to the people of Nazareth who had so grown up with Jesus as part of their environment that they took him for granted. 
mm -hmm. and couldn't see the excellence and specialness of his message and his person. Well, you, what you're describing is more like the introduction of the gospel by St. Paul to a totally uh, pagan society that had no background and found this completely refreshing as opposed to the tiredness of their own worn out paganism of the past. This is something that seems to be uh, a revitalization for possibility in Norway then. Yes, and I, I, I think there is a case to be made for saying that we're perhaps, I mean, I, I'm just proffering this as a hypothesis, but that we're perhaps on the cusp of a sort of a cultural transition from a stage of secularization to a stage of post-secularism, mm -hmm. where, as you say, people are a bit tired of senselessness. Um, and, I mean, I, I find that all the time, that there is... You know, there is a lot of sincere searching going on. There are many people out there who are really people of goodwill, but unsure about the how to orient their will. Mm -hmm. And there, I think, I mean, we have a great task of uh, of of teaching, of enlightenment, and, and above all, of trying to set a, a, a good, coherent example. It, it, Again, to go back to the beginning of our conversation, that same sense of being at the Lord's service to help stir up that creation of infinity and eternity within the hearts of the people. God has put it there. How does he use us to help them discover God and Jesus Christ is this this way that you satisfy that drive towards infinity absolutely and 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 to help them realize that that the the, the existential hunger they may experience perhaps experience simply in negative terms as a sense of absence or a sense of frustration or a sense of pain but that it it may actually mean something and it may point to point to something which is a carrier of sense. I, I, th I think that's a, if you like, th that's a crucial sort of propedeutic stage of, uh, of, of evangelization, of sharing, and of preparing the ground for good news. Yeah, it might s seem to me that uh, an annual Easter presentation of Mahler's Second Symphony would be a <laughs> useful tool. <laughs> No, no, that, it, 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 I'm sure it would work for some. It might not work for all. No, <laughs> but it still would be beautiful music. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And one of the other areas where you reach is not only something like wonderful music by Mahler, uh, but also the Internet. Uh, you're using this website, coramfratribus.com. What does that mean Coram Fratribus? Well, it, it's simply, it, it's an excerpt from the phrase that I've taken as my Episcopal motto, Coram Fratribus Intellexi, which you could translate along the lines of face to face with my brethren, I've come to understanding. Mm -hmm. And that phrase uh, was given me really in the sense that it came to me in a book that a friend of mine had written. Um, which cites a sermon of Pope Gregory the Great, uh, who was a monk who became a bishop. Yes. Um, and it's from Gregory the Great's sermons on Ezekiel. And as anyone who's tried reading Ezekiel will know, it's a difficult text sometimes. And Gregory reflects on the experience that many of us may have had when we've sat down with the scriptures. And he says, when I sit down with a page of this book, in the privacy of my own soul, it happens not rarely that I don't understand anything at all. I don't really understand what it's about. I don't see what the relevance of this passage to my life is. I don't know what to do with it. But then he says, this strange thing occurs that I go down to church for Vespers and I'm there 
inquire face to face with my brothers. You have to imagine and envisage a monastic choir. And I hear this same text read again, and it makes perfect sense. Because I hear it then as addressed not only to me, but to the church. Um, and I hear it as a transformative word that in the sheer act of enunciation of reading aloud exercises power that inspires and unites, um, stirring us to conversion and stirring us to action. So implicit in that motto is the fact that we must beware of, of privatizing faith as a personal project of self-improvement. And certainly we must be careful of not to privatize uh, the scriptures privatize religion and always lodge ourselves afresh within the living communion of the church as a place of encounter. So mm -hmm. that's why I chose it for the website as well, because I, my, my, my pious aspiration uh, when I started it was that the website might become a place of encounter, which it's sort of, which it's sort of turned into, which is uh, rather a, an astonishment to me, but also a delight. I, it reminds me of an experience I've had, and I'm sure you, you've had in preaching and teaching that something in Scripture all of a sudden becomes clearer in the act of preaching. I, I got Absolutely. my dissertation, the, the key insight for my dissertation, while teaching a passage on radio. I was just explaining a certain passage in uh, the book of Samuel. And it just coalesced. I said, aha, that's it. That's, I understand. You know, and you, you get that insight because the word of God is to the church. And this is, it's uh, in, in the church community where the tradition is passed on, the word is passed on. All of this is part of our community experience. And I, I think we can all verify that from experience, as you say. And, and, it's, and every time it's, uh, it's just overwhelming in the, sh the sheer gratuity and graciousness of that experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. That this is, you know, an act of God's grace that is stirring within us in that community experience. We, that's, we receive the Eucharist in community, we understand uh, in community. Excellency, we have just a minute. Any final reflections by you in the last uh, one minute? Now that's rather putting me on the spot. Um, <laughs> I, I, I would say that uh, an image that is very dear to me um, is origin, one of Origen's, the, the great yes. early Christian teacher. Uh, one of his sermons on, on the book of Genesis, he talks about that most mysterious of the patriarchs, Isaac, about whom we don't really know very much and who does all sorts of perplexing things. I mean, he goes for long walks and he weeps and he's silent a lot. But there's one thing he does with tremendous coherence throughout his life, and that is to dig out again the wells that were dug by his father Abraham, uh, wells that the Philistines had filled with all sorts of uh, gravel and mud to prevent the Israelites' flocks from drinking. So. Isaac undug these wells in order to permit the flock to drink. And I think that is a great parable of what our task is today. And it's, a, it's an exacting task, but also a very joyful task. Yeah, I, especially when you get to drink the water. Thank Absolutely. you very much. I, I like that reflection. That's very good. And I thank you for taking time to be with us. And Thank you for you, having me. And if you would join me in blessing our audience, may Almighty God bless you all and keep you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, Amen. You know, we, we've started up EWTN in Norway. I know you're very involved in that, Excellency. And we can bring you this program with, the, uh, with Bishop Varden of Trondheim and all the other programs we do only because this network is brought to you by you. So please remember to keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill. And as you show us generosity, 
we'll be able to pay all of our bills too. God bless you and thank you all.